tell I'm speaking to you from the worship space here at St. Matthews. And although I'm alone, I sort of imagine you being here with me. We are apart physically because of the circumstances, but by the Holy Spirit, we are actually together in our shared belief. What I want to do this morning is simply to do the calling of the day and the gospel and then offer you a reflection. Well, let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ gives the water of eternal life, may we always thirst for you, the spring of life and source of goodness, through him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Gospel today is from John 4. It's a very familiar reading to many. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no luck and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to her people, come and see the man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city 
and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. seems that everywhere you turn these days, the question of how women are treated, mainly by men, is on the forefront of the headlines, and indeed in the courts. The Me Too movement has become a symbol of the desire, finally, to treat women as the equal of men and not as their subjects, or, or rather objects, of unwanted attention. Are, are you aware that the Anglican Communion also has a department dedicated to this issue of gender justice, uh, actually arising from one of our five marks of mission, to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, and pursue peace and reconciliation. As widespread as such gender abuse is in our culture, it is critically present in other parts of the world. One thinks of the plight of girls and women in many parts of Africa and in India. One of the most egregious wastes of human potential you can imagine. Here in North America, we are bombarded with reported behaviors that are beyond belief sometimes, touching many industries and activities. To our shame, the church, too, not free of criticism about the inappropriate treatment of children and women. Somehow it seems to be even more of a terror than a terror when it occurs within the community of faith. Who of us has not been recently affected by recent revelations concerning Jean Vanny, considered by many to be a saint within the Christian church? For me, he has been just that. And I've had a difficult time sorting out what I believe went wrong. In Jesus' time, even more so than now, women suffered injuries and injustice almost as a way of life. That is the subtext for Jesus' famous encounter with the woman at the well in Samaria that we read this morning in this morning's Gospel from John. Of course, not only was there an issue of gender between Jesus and this woman, but it all takes place in the heart of Samaria. You'll remember that there was tremendous animosity between Jesus and Samaritans historically. They argued and sometimes fought about the chosen place to worship God. The Temple Mount of Moriah in Jerusalem, according to Judaism, and Mount Gerizim, according to to Samaritanism. The roots of their differences went back to the return from exile in Babylon and the strife that occurred at that time had poisoned their relationships severely. 
in addition to the bad feelings between the Jews and the Samaritans, this encounter at the well in John was problematic because Jesus was choosing to engage a Samaritan woman. As a Jewish male, Jesus was in a position of advantage over the woman. But as a thirsty and tired sojourner, he is obviously at a disadvantage as well. For he's a foreigner and doesn't even have the bucket with which to draw water, as the woman points out. Jesus invites their dialogue by becoming vulnerable. Give me a drink, he asks. And by allowing the woman to exercise some power over him, after all, she is the one with the bucket. The scene presents a paradox. He is the giver of living water, thirsty himself, a parched traveler messiah, and a resourceful woman will find out that they need each other. It's a wonderful metaphor for how God and humanity are intimately interconnected. After a play on the words on the meaning of living water, Jesus overcomes his own Jewish temple tradition by affirming that God is best worshipped in spirit. This is the first indication of the kingdom that he is initiating. He does away with the temple institution both in Israel and in Samaria and points to a different faith reality which includes all. It's a reality which he announces is present in him. In their subsequent theological discussion, Jesus engages the woman as a valid conversation partner to whom he makes, as I've said, the first self-revelation of the entire gospel. Verse 26, I am he, he says. By so doing, he was actually also including this woman in his circle of disciples because the Samaritan woman then went back to her village and witnessed to the townspeople concerning Jesus. As a consequence, the Samaritans eventually made their own Christological confession. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that he is truly the savior of the world. Jesus also builds community here in Samaria by crossing racial boundaries and breaking the distinction between the chosen people and rejected people. He is extending the mission of the Jewish Messiah to the Samaritan people and of course beyond. The ones who were hated by the Jews for what they saw as their history of racial mixture and religious confusion he did not account for. This encounter offers us an important lesson about our false assumptions of who God loves and died for. Sometimes I fear we can be quite insular in the church and protective of our own boundaries. We often exclude even other denominations that are Christians as well. Jesus, however, brings an inclusive truth to his message. First, because of the central importance of a woman in this story, and also because he crosses the boundary between Jew and Samaritan. His kingdom vision includes all, and we, you and I, are the benefits of that. Additionally, there is the matter of the five husbands, a reason many have taught that she was a woman of ill repute. There is no reason to make that assumption. This is not necessarily proof of a licentious life. Even with the certainty that she had, in fact, apparently had five husbands, it is possible, of course, that all her husbands had died. It is also possible that one or more of them had divorced her. And if that was the case, she would have had no say in the matter because she would have had no legal status in the time of Jesus. Note that in spite of his awareness of her lifestyle, Jesus makes no move to contend her. He is simply 
using this point of reference to convince her that he is more than she thinks he is. He continues on in his dialogue with her and his self-revelation as the Messiah. The Samaritan woman proceeds to evangelize her neighbors, becoming Jesus' disciple in her own right, to the amazement of the other disciples, no doubt. Her growing faith bears fruit in the new belief of the villagers who meet Jesus and become convinced over the next two days he was with them. Scholars note that this story, related only in John's Gospel, suggests that the early church, at least in the Johannine community, experienced a diversity of believers and also legitimized the discipleship of women. In a sense, it already points to our current world. Let me also make some observations here about this encounter and what it might teach us about how we live out our discipleship as followers of Jesus. First, boundaries such as race and gender should not limit our efforts to extend God's kingdom. That activity must transcend all of our prejudices and assumptions. Second, God desires the healing of every human being, not, not their condemnation. Note the word of John 3.17. I know you know well John 3.16. I just wish John 3.17 was as well known. It says this. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. We too should not rush to judgment at the expense of God's healing and the unveiling of the kingdom of heaven. Thirdly, we cannot go in advance what the results of our sharing of God's love for the world will accomplish. No matter where we go or to whom we speak of God, God has and is already there. That's how the Holy Spirit works to promote God's kingdom. And finally, and there is comfort in this, our discipleship responsibility is only to announce the Messiah and not to worry about the consequences or the results. God looks after that. And for all those things, we are thankful to God. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for this word of encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. May we let it speak to us in our encounters with those beyond us, those outside the church. Help us to be thankful for your spirit and the work that the spirit does in drawing all people to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.